Hi folks, welcome back to World War II TV and the last proper show before Christmas. I've actually got six days without a show. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. Uh, I have so enjoyed doing this show and I've, the, this series of shows. It's been really fantastic. I'm learning all the time and I hope you are too because as we've been kind of getting across to you, the Battle of the Bulge is so much more than what happened in Baston. It's so much more than Nuts and McAuliffe. And not that that's a bad story, but there's so much more to it tonight. Now, Today, we are talking about cavalry groups, and I hope there's a lot of people out there going, so what the hell is a mechanized cavalry group? Well, we're going to find out today. Um, as you can understand, I read a hell of a lot of books now I'm doing World War II TV, and some of the books uh, are, are just kind of reinforcing stuff I already knew. Sometimes Eastern Front, Pacific, it's new stuff to me, but ETO, often some of the stuff I read, it kind of just, you know, it's stuff I already know. This book, by today's guest, um, Sabres Through the Reich, pretty much all of it from page one to the last page was stuff I didn't know. I thought I knew a bit about it, but I didn't. Um, our guest makes the point that we kind of know about armor divisions, we know about infantry divisions, but we don't know, know about this cavalry arm. And if people do know about cavalry, they think horses. Um, but anyway, my guest today, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel William Nance, uh, teaches military history. He's a uh, serving soldier he knows cavalry he knows tanks he knows armored cars i'm delighted to have him there so without further ado i will introduce william so good afternoon how are you doing i'm doing great thanks for having me well thanks for coming along because as i said right when i started planning these shows i wanted to cover the ardennes from slightly different points of view because you know we we, we know the story of the bois jacques we know noville we know baston so cavalry um Let's take us through this concept kind of from baby steps right up the Ardennes, because when we talk about World War II and we talk about the Germans, the Russians and Americans, the British, we have these terms we apply to certain nations, you know, deep war to Russians, blitzkrieg to Germans, British. We think of artillery and agoras and artillery groups. Cavalry, to me, is something that I particularly associate with the USA. So run us through the history of the cavalry, how it morphs into World War II, and exactly what we're talking about today in a kind of a, you know, five minutes or less. I know you could talk for two hours on this, but kind of a basic, hit us with the basics. Okay, so American cavalry and European cavalry kind of are different to begin with. Um, they start off with uh, European cavalry, think uh, Napoleon, Carassier, uh, and I'll apologize right up front for my pronunciations. My joke is I kind of do mucho gringo, everything. Um, and uh, shock cavalry. American cavalry fights very, very differently. Uh, and that starts from the revolution on forward, which is they generally move mounted, fight dismounted. Europeans would call this dragoons, uh, and, they, and that kind of sticks with it for quite some time. In fact, the first two regiments of American cavalry that are formed are the first and second regiments of dragoons. Uh, and that has stayed with their uh, lineage this entire time. Um, we, we create a third regiment. It's the regiment of mounted rifles. Uh, the dragoons were carrying short carbines. The uh, third cavalry at the time uh, were carrying uh, full up rifles. Again, move mounted, fight dismounted. And really you see the american civil war where it's really kind of kind of kicking off in terms of refining our doctrine to what it is that we do um cavalry has always been kind of a scouting arm uh hussars uh are the uh, european version of it but uh cavalry with the american arm has always been a little bit more loosey-goosey with this so when you see the uh in the civil war you see buford right we've all seen the movie gettysburg Buford, uh, he's got his cavalry division out forward of the Army of the Potomac trying to find the enemy because really in any kind of action, any attack can be defeated with enough information. Any defense can be defeated with enough information given reasonable odds. Obviously, if it's 30 to 1, nobody doesn't really matter, right? Uh, so the idea is finding out what's on the other side of that dang hill. And uh, so what you have is you've got our scouts out, you've got the enemy scouts out. And the name of the game is blind the other guy, prevent them from uh, knowing what's going on with your formation and know as much about their actions as possible so that your forces can commit under the best possible uh, conditions as you see. Uh, so what you see is like, 
you know, at Gettysburg. Buford uh, realizes, wow, this is a really good ground. So what does he do? He goes forward into a defensive screen. Doctrinal uh, theorists, could, we could argue, is it a screen? Is it a guard? Those are all doc doctrinal te technical terms. But what he is, is he is basically gaining ground, pre uh, preventing the Confederate Army from knowing where the Union Army is. And you see Lee commits under incredibly bad conditions. His cavalry is off doing a raid somewhere else, and he actually has cavalry with him at Gettysburg, which is missed a lot of the time, but it's guarding supply trains, it's doing other things. So his infantry runs right into the Union cavalry, Union sets up perfectly well. I know this is World War II, but this is such a well-known historical example of cavalry doing its thing. It's also one of the very few times the American army is fighting at the operational level of war. Really, yeah. we don't have a lot of cases in our history where we're doing that. Um, and so that's where American cavalry kind of gets its idea from, is that it's there to protect the main body. It also has kind of a secondary mission of protecting the southern border of the United States. Uh, if you remember Pancho Villa yeah, and the punitive expedition, that's uh, it's cavalry down there. There's a reason why the only cavalry division in the United States Army throughout really existence is headquartered at Fort Bliss, which is El Paso, Texas, uh, which is kind of center along there or along that region. So that's what cavalry is doing, and that's what cavalry's kind of uh, thought of for this whole time. They can use horses, which means it's very easy. You get, you jump off the horse, you grab your rifle, you go, you fight. One one man out of every four is hold, holding the horses. Well, in the interwar era, all of a sudden people get vehicles. Well, the vehicles are great in that they've got radios, they've got machine guns, they can go fast, they can do all sorts of great things. The problem comes into they're not really great for fighting dismounted. Vehicles can go many places, but they can't go everywhere as opposed to a horse. So there's this huge conflict going on in the 20s and the 30s as to what mechanization looks like for the cavalry branch. Uh, is it all... You know, just use the vehicles to, you know, go go way out and find people and then report back and let the horse cavalry fight for information dismounted. Or do we fully mechanize and find some way to do this? There's lots of without going into huge amounts of details. Uh, that is a conflict that the cavalry branches and the armor branch is fighting through this whole time. In fact, the armor branch is a creation of both the infantry and the armor or correction the infantry branch and the cavalry branch, because the infantry owned the tanks, the cavalry owned combat cars, and the mechanized elements of both are combined into the armor force in 1940. Well, cavalry branch goes, okay, so mechanization, those are the armored divisions. They're going to do armored division stuff. We're going to stay with our horses. Well, that lasts until 1942 when all the horses, when McNair says, no, all the horses are going away. It's stupid to fight on horses in 1940s. You're all going to be mechanized. The doctrine is still sneak and peek. So which is why when you see the organization, it's very, very light. It's light tanks. It's small armored cars. It's Jeeps. Um, and the, the logic there is that they're just going to go out and they're going to find the other guy, but they're not going to fight for information very heavily. Um, uh, as you look at this table of organization here, this is not meant to go up against another mechanized force. They're probably going to lose. Uh, they don't have enough uh, armor. They don't have enough armor-piercing weaponry. Um, whereas they're also not meant to go up against an infantry force. This is uh, this whole uh, squadron is about 700, give or take, guys. A typical infantry battalion's got about... Um, couple thousand uh all, 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 all told so you've got an infantry so you've got a cavalry regiment of about yeah, 14 1500 people an infantry regiment's got 5000 yeah and uh, so an, but an infantry regiment's designed to be concentrated and the cavalry's designed to be spread out they're designed to use their mobility and so what we come up with is this doctrine and i'm skipping over a lot uh yeah. but the but this doctrine of hey, you're just going to go out and find them and tell that to other people, and the other people will then go and fight. That doesn't work. Uh, what's funny is, is that the American cavalry doesn't like that doctrine either because up until when they had horses, like 
hey, we fought for information. We're going to continue to fight for information. You need us to fight for information. So that's what they end up doing. Um, now, what they also end up getting used for is all sorts of other things, because what you have is a very mobile uh, force that can be in a, used in a lot of different ways. So you see them used in economy of force roles. Um, very briefly, an economy of force is you've got a lot of ground to cover and you want to mass someplace. So what you do is you tell some guy, hey, look, doctrine says you, you should really be on a front on a frontage of five kilometers. I'm going to give you 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers. It's a gamble. And the cavalry is good for that because they're able to be mobile and they're able to move very quickly around there. Um, but they can also, so it's not just the security and the reconnaissance, it's secured, it's uh, the economy of force role as well. And so we talked about this broad front strategy that is used in World War II, uh, well, Northwest Europe, particularly for the Americans. And you think, well, we have this also, this 90 division gamble. The US Army only mobilizes 89 divisions. Now we also mobilize six Marine divisions, which somehow we never throw into that number because 90 just sounds better, right? Uh, so, but how do you square 90 divisions total globally and a broad front strategy in Western Europe? And the answer is, is that you use cavalry to hold large swaths of this front. Um, multiple times throughout the campaign in Northwest Europe, you have cavalry groups, again, 14, 1500 guys holding frontages that a core is going to replace. And of course, take your pick, but call it 40, 50,000 soldiers. So 1,500 guys holding a ground that might be better suited for 40,000. And as part but, of this change, ever just to interrupt you, Bill, is also because we when we go from 1940 to 1944, which is kind of the period we're talking about today, we've also seen that the uh, the commanders are able to use and rely on the other aspects of intelligence, ultra aerial photos, and that's becoming more and more um, uh, achievable because as we gain air super superiority, we can fly aircraft over take on more photos. We're refining our intelligence uh, and all that aspect of things as well. So therefore the use of cavalry to be the, as they were in the Civil War era, the only eyes and ears of an army. Now they are one set of eyes and ears of an army among many others. So I'm, I'm guessing their, their, their ability to be a mobile kind of gap filler force is also because the, the reconnaissance work they're doing is, is still important, but it's not their only responsibility now. Right. And then it also depends on when you are, right? For instance, a highly mobile campaign like in northern France, you're going to want a cavalry formation out front because you don't know what's out in front of you. So you're going to poke the bushes with a stick to see what comes out of it. Sometimes it's hard on the stick. Uh, so when you're in a static fighting, like, uh, for instance, uh, what you see up on the West Wall and really from about September through really March, of 45 or September 44 to March of 45. At that point, you kind of slammed up against the enemy. You kind of know where he's at. He kind of knows where you're at. Yeah. You're still doing patrol and you're still doing these security operations, but your mainline formations can handle this at that particular stage in the game. Uh, the big problem you really run into with aerial reconnaissance is that once the enemy kind of twigs to the fact that you've got air superiority, they start coming up with ways to hide from aerial hide themselves. Yeah, exactly. And uh, once, and now the Germans never did figure out ultra, which is fascinating uh, in a lot of ways. And now some of this is because we took a lot of very good operational security measures to not let them know that we knew. Um, but really what it comes out to is, is that nothing is going to beat a guy on the ground or in these days, guy or gal on the ground uh looking physically at it uh because there are ways of hiding from electronic uh there's ways of hiding from uh flying over the air flying over it but it's really hard to hide from a guy sitting there kind of looking in going hey there he is yeah. um and it's the only way to really prevent surpri surprise to have someone out in front of you to do that now we talked about the cavalry groups. Now these are regimental formations, and they're in charge, and they're in, uh, assigned to corps. Um, the armored divisions are going to have their own cavalry reconnaissance squadrons. Uh, 
also commonly referred to as armored reconnaissance squadrons. Uh, the name kind of changes back and forth. Uh, also armored reconnaissance battalions. Um, and very briefly for uh, any uh, 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 Commonwealth uh, uh, viewers, American Squadron is a battalion size organization. I know in most Commonwealth militaries, a squadron is really a company size formation. Yeah, in pretty much. Yeah. There. So these armor divisions have a full squadron or battalion in order to support their reconnaissance. And even the infantry divisions have a troop, so a company of uh, cavalry that they're going to co uh, use for uh, specialized reconnaissance. It's only a troop because it's an infantry division. It's generally not as mobile. It's uh, so you're not moving as fast. There's less need to spread out over as much ground. That, that's kind of how that works. And uh, we, I mean, mind as well, of course, we, we, we British, we have the reconnaissance uh, squadron as a, as a core, you know, the, the shortest lived regiment in British regimental history, founded in 41, disbanded in 46. And I'm thinking as we're talking about the wonderful presentation Gareth Davies did a few months ago about the Indian reconnaissance troops in, in, in Italy who were doing literally everything. They were engaging armor, they were doing scouting, they were doing patrolling, they were escorting other people. That You name it, they were doing it. They, 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 these, are, these are units across the board, America, Britain, that are reinventing their roles on almost daily basis because they can, because they've got this mobility. And but while we've got the um, organizational structure up there, we've talked about, for those who don't know, Let's talk about the horse of the uh, the cavalry group, the, the, the M8 armored car, because I've spent quite a bit of time riding the back of M8 armored cars. Everyone knows what Jeeps are. Uh, and we talk about the M5 uh, vehicles as well. So so there's a nice newspaper clipping I found that sort of shows the firepower of a reconnaissance squadron. So you've got M5s uh, and the M8 armored cars and Jeeps. Now, as you said yourself, this is they're not going to fight their way against an armored unit, really. They're not really going to be able to engage an infantry unit with anti-tank weapons, but they can move fast and they've got this mobility. So this is the M8 armored car. So what, 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 for those who don't know what this is and what it can do, give us a kind of a basic idea to what its strengths and what its role is. The, uh, this is basically, uh, there were, I want to say there's like three of these in every platoon. And basically their, their job, that 37 millimeter cannon up there, we'll politely call it a cannon. Uh, you know, in, in 1942 and before, a 37 millimeter is a great weapon system. Uh, 1943 and beyond, a 37 millimeter cannon ain't going to do much to anybody except tick them off. Um, now, that said, a tank. A 37 millimeter cannon is great when you want to fight infantry or people running around in trucks or even yep. perhaps a half track. So that's kind of like the fire support of the, of the cavalry. When the cavalry are trying to fight someone, the, that half track or not that half track, this, this Greyhound is going to come up and going to provide some sort of fire support. You can put a 50 cal up on top of that and it's got some armor protection, some, not a lot. Uh, a 50 cal is going through that, or a 12 point uh, for the, our European uh, viewers, a 12.7 millimeter is going through that very easily. Um, really, even kind of hold your breath when the when a 30 caliber <laughs> or a 762 yeah. hits it. Um, but small arms, it's going to do okay. Shell fragments, it's going to do okay, and it's better than nothing, right? So uh, you can bring up that armored car, and it's going to provide you some fire support. It's going to uh, put the infantry's heads down, and it's going to allow your dismounted cavalry scouts, who in many cases are armed with M1 carbines, which is it's like a baby M1 Garand. Uh, it's got a 30 caliber carbine uh, ammunition. Calling it a calling it a rifle is not accurate. It, it, it's it's basically a glorified pistol in a, in a rifle. Yeah, it's it's, it's a it's a big pistol, isn't it? Rather than a small rifle, I always think. Yeah. It's a great weapon to have when you're required to carry a weapon, but you don't need one. Yeah, it's not a great weapon to have when you actually need to hurt someone. Uh, so a lot of the there are stories of all these cavalry scouts. They take their carbines and they throw them in the bushes and go and grab an M1 Grand the first chance they got. But yeah, that, that's what this gray hand is doing for us. Is it's really providing the fire support and the suppressive ability, and it's got just enough armor where if all the enemy's got is machine guns and rifles it can kind of take that hit and suppress those guys, allowing your dismounts to move around them. 
But it's got speed. I mean, 55 miles an hour. My friends who oh, yeah. own them in, in England, I mean, they'll say it will do over 60, 65, and, you know, which is twice as fast as most armored vehicles, isn't it? Pretty much. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's relying on speed to get in quickly and equally to get out quickly again. Um, right. It, which, which, it, go ahead. Sorry, which 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 also we, we can include the the M5 as well. Again, a similar thing, thirty seven millimeter. Again, this is track though, but again, can't do much in in terms of fight, but pretty nippy. Yeah, it's got some speed on it. Now you want to be careful with speed too, because speed will get you killed. Uh, speed is safety sometimes, and speed will get you killed in other times. Uh, so great story from the Fifteenth Cavalry Group. Uh, they're charging through Brittany, and they're hauling down the road. 40 miles an hour and get ambushed. And the, the group commander ends up getting captured and spends the rest of his, uh, spends the rest of the war on the Island of Jersey uh, as, as a prisoner of war, uh, because you miss an ambush going 40 miles an hour, but you're right. They do have some speed and that tactical mobility is going to come in such a great, uh, is going to be such great use for them uh, as they go forward. What allows them to do very quickly is also reposition operationally rapidly. Yeah. Fourth Cavalry Group goes all the way from north, just south of Aachen in uh, December of 45, 44, and repositions all the way down to the south, to the northwest tip of the bulge in less than a day. Because they can jump on the roads and move out with purpose. And, uh, and we should just reference the for the M24 that we got on screen there. That's more coming in towards the end of the war, but it is kind of the, the, the obvious and very decent upgrade on an M5. I mean, considerably better. And anybody who's ever watched the opening sequence of Bridget Remagen, those chaffies running along the, the river back there is one of the greatest war movie opening sequences, I think, ever. And uh, Shell Drake, one of our regular viewers, reminding us, of course, this is the classic speed firepower protection uh, triangle that is the same whether you're talking about infantry or or um or vehicles, isn't it? It's uh, do you move fast with less stuff on you? Do you do you have more firepower? But it, that that classic that classic um um dilemma that really ha has never been cured. That you always have to compromise one to have two others strong uh, is the way I look at it. Right, or or uh, or make one really strong at the compromise of two others. Yeah, uh, and the, what you see with the chaffy is a recognition that. Our, that the cavalry is doing more than just reconnaissance. Yeah. And uh, so when they when they just thought, hey, these guys are going to be out front, they're just going to say, hey, there they are, and, and run back and tell the folks, M5 is good enough to basically survive long enough to do that. As they start getting into the war, they realize that's not cutting the mustard. We're doing more things. We're doing all these things. So you get, you know, a, a, it's like, hey, look, Enemy armor has improved since we bought the since we bought the Stuart. We now need the Chaffee yeah. from 37 to a 75 millimeter. Of course, the American armor formations are going from 75 to 76 to 90 uh, during the same time frame. But again, the idea is not to kill everybody. The idea is to kill the enemy scouts who are also similarly lightly equipped in armor. Yeah, and then wait for the bigger forces to arrive on on both sides. There, really, exactly. So um, we've got just a couple of photos here because we're going to get into the, the nitty gritty soon, which is the, the, their role in the Battle of the, Ard of the Ardennes. But, you know, th these are the, the classic images of M8s in, in, in the winter of 44, 45. And you see them there. And th these we'll talk about later on because this is that famous sequence of the of the of Potto, which we're going to be talking about later on of M8s and M20s at the side of the road and what have you. But we'll talk about that in more detail. But th these are your classic images of, of these units. They're, they're, they're you know, as you said, they're lightly equipped, small units, move, but highly mobile. And, um, yeah, the, the, there's not many of these photos out there. You see way more photos of Sherman tanks, way more photos of infantry and Foxhole. This is these five or six photos are pretty much all I could find for the winter of 44, 45. Um, of yeah, and of course, what's fascinating many. about them is these guys are all over the place, too. First Americans into Paris are New Jersey cavalrymen supporting the 4th Infantry Division. Uh, and so that very classic photo of the M8 in front of uh, the Arc de Triomphe yeah. is of, I want to say, the uh, 102nd Cavalry Group, uh, New Jersey Sounds Cavalry. Right to me. Uh, and... You look at these guys, and they're all over the place, yet 
you, you made some comment about, you know, oh, the, this was the most important. People will argue, well, this was the most important. This is the most important part. Cavalry were always the supporting element there. They were always in the background helping other people do things, uh, kind of fighting that battle before the battle, or they're on the edges of the battle. Um, uh, yesterday, you were talking about the battles of Aracourt uh, with the 4th Armored Division. Uh Right before the battles of Aircourt, there's fighting at Lunaville, uh, which is when uh, one of the German Panzer Brigades smashes into the flank of the 4th Armored Division. The people that make first contact, they're at the 2nd Cavalry Group. And they kind of have a bad day because uh, their only anti-tank weapon is if you had that picture of the Scott up there, the uh, which is, it's a 75 millimeter, but it's a howitzer, which means it's low velocity, which means it's not punching holes in armor. Now you can knock off a track or something like that. So the cavalry lose a chunk of these. They lose like five out of six. It's 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 a uh, pretty egregious. But what they do is they strip off the German infantry, hmm. and at that point, the Fourth Armored Division and a couple other folks uh, just kind of come in. They slow the Germans down for just long enough that the uh, that the uh, American Armored Division shows up, and it turns into a full scale rumble. With this is the very beginnings which then translate into the fighting at Eric Court and whatnot. But we yeah. don't talk about that because Eric Court's more fun to talk about. I mean, I like that. Yeah, and, and the, the same could apply with Cobra. In the, that They're on the flanks of Cobra as well. So when we go back to Normandy, there's a lot of work these cavalry groups are doing there that gets overlooked because of the, the dramatic advances kind of in the middle of the of the, of the the arrow thrusting towards but the, the, the side parts that don't get talked about. But let's, let's bring it up to the Ardennes and let's bring it up to the state of play, December the 16th. So as we, 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 we've covered on all the shows coming up here with Peter Caddick Adams last Monday about the, the everyone's kind of anticipating that not, not much is going to happen over the winter. First Army is kind of holding this area there. They're rotating some of the more experienced infantry divisions out because they're not expecting much and some of the greener ones are coming in and everyone's kind of just content to kind of hold that north-south line and kind of wait for the weather to get better in the spring. So give us, you mentioned it already about the fact these cavalry groups can hold a large area because this is this is integral to what we're talking about and why we brought you onto the show there. And this is the map um, you provided us. So ex explain what the map is and explain wh where where they are and who we're talking about. Okay, so this is actually one of the maps. This is actually in the evening of the after the first day of the offensive there. So this is the uh, the 14th Cavalry Group kind of after the first day of fighting. Uh, so uh, if you could, if you could pull up actually one of the Google Earth images, because uh, this one shows a little bit later. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a great one. Um, so what you see here is... This is the kind of the northern shoulder of the bulge uh, as we're uh, as we're on the 16th of December. And you please forgive my very rough line drawings. These are not 100 percent accurate in terms of exact locations. But I'm going to draw your attention to the two CRSs, which are the abbreviation is Cavalry Recon Squadrons. So you see the 18th CRS, which is the one half of the 14th Cavalry Group. And you get the 38th uh, CRS, which is one half of the 102nd Cavalry Group. Uh, 14th Cavalry is a regular army formation. 102nd Cavalry is a National Guard formation. Uh, in the American Army, we are very, we, we very much like to uh, kind of highlight our unit lineages. So the first thing to remember is, is that in the middle of December, the U.S. Army has just finished a massive offensive. Every single corps in the 1st, the 9th, and the 3rd Armies and that's in the 12th Army Group, and then the, the 7th Army down in the south, had just finished a massive offensive uh, trying to get to the Roar River or other places. And uh, so just to the north of what you're seeing on this map, you have the 7th Corps, which is fighting, grinding its way through the bulk of the Hartkin Forest, You've got the 13th. The same the 7th Ninth. Corps that ground, ground its way up the Sherbal Peninsula six months earlier. The same 7th Corps that is just about spent in terms of just the exhaustion they've been facing. Um, you know, the 4th and the uh, the 90th and the, you know, just, they're, they're on their, they're, they're in British Army, they're chin strapped by now. They're on their chin straps. These oh, guys. yeah. And uh, so what you see is, is that by, by November, they've done all this. They fought through Aachen. They've done the Hurtkin Forest. The 19th Corps and the 
the 13th Corps fought all the way to the Roar River in conjunction with the British Army. The 21st Army Group is uh, fighting through as well. Um, uh, some great joint action go occurring during Gile in, around Geilenkirk and with the 13th Corps and British 30 Corps. Um, all this is going on in November and into December. And what you see is, is that the 9th Army reaches the Roar River and suddenly realizes there are these dams up on the Roar River where you see on that circle, it's, uh, I've got the, the marked in approximate location. And they realize that if the Germans own the dams, they can't get across the river until because the Germans just open up the, the floodgates and they'll get washed away. So they ask the first army, first army, you guys got to handle this. So fifth Corps, which is what you mostly see on this map, is tasked to take the Roar River dams. So you got the second infantry division attacking from the south, and I think it's the 78th infantry division attacking from the north. Uh, I don't have them listed there, but and the 99th infantry division has to throw in some additional combat power there. Incidentally, the second infantry division had held the ground that the 106th infantry division had just held. Yeah. 106th infantry division shows up. Second goes, hey guys, you got this quiet sector. We got to go take care of these rural river dams. So the second infantry division is a salty division. Came one of the first divisions across the beaches. Uh, not they're not an invasion division, but one of the very first reinforcement divisions. Across second the day, beach. yeah, yeah. And so they're salty. They're experienced. They kind of know what they're doing. They hand it off to the 106th and go, hey guys, you got this. And they go off and they take care of this attack. 106 is like uh, okay, and uh, their their positions are pretty janky as we'll see a, a little bit later in terms of organization. So this attack is going on the morning of the 16th of December. So Fifth Corps is in the middle of its attack when the Germans launch their offensive. The only corps that has not launched an attack during this time frame is Eighth Corps. Eighth Corps had been over in uh, Brittany taking care of Brest. They'd been transshipped over to uh, this part of the front. Fifth Corps owned this entire sector of the front. They take over and immediately all of their di uh, divisions are sent elsewhere and they're getting tore up divisions, the 28th division, the 4th infantry division, or the Greenhorns, the 106th infantry division. So all of these, all this stuff is arriving kind of at the same time, uh, you know, so the 8th Corps is the only people not attacking and the main reason is is the ground sucks uh there's a re uh the fifth corps had attacked it here in september with the fourth infantry division and what's interesting is that if you pull up the u.s army official history of the fifth corps hits the west wall there's a map there and it shows the front line trace of the fourth infantry division it's the exact same front line trace of the 106th infantry division on 16 december 1944. Because they said they're like, this ground sucks. There's nothing here. Also, if you look to the east, there's nothing in Germany worth taking. There's Prum, then there, uh, which again, I apologize for my pronunciation. And then there's Bitburg, but it's like the hardest way to get to the Rhine River. There's a reason why people talk, oh, the Ardennes, it's an uh, invasion quarter. And it is 1870, 1940, uh, 1944. But again, the but the other direction. But yeah, yeah other, going, going west as opposed to going east. Yeah, and and, uh, and also it's oriented southwest. The kind of the grain of the country, the roads, all that kind of stuff. There's a reason why the bulge ends up happening like it does, is because that's where the roads are. To kind of make that hook north uh, uh, for the Germans, that right hook, you've got to cut across some pretty nasty terrain, and the roads don't support it. And so the Americans kind of look at this and go, hey, 8th Corps, your job, just hold this line. Don't, don't see what's going on. So you have the 106th infantry that's sitting there. And if you can go to the other uh, Google Earth image real briefly there. Um, and this is kind of a blow up of the 106th front. And you have one squadron of the uh, uh, 14th Cavalry Group holding the Losheim Gap. Uh, that's where you see the 18 CRS plus an anti-tank battery. And this is not M18s. This isn't even M10s. These are towed anti-tank guns. You know, this is like the low quality, you know, we still have these guys. We didn't have enough M18s and M10s to give everyone self-propelled. That's okay. Nothing's going to happen here. And if they figured if something does happen, it's going to be a small light push. And it's not, it's actually off the western edge of this map. 
you have the 14, the uh, the 32nd Cavalry Con Squadron. It's kind of the reserve for this sector. Now, it's pretty bad when you have a single light cavalry squadron as your sector reserve. You've got a combat command of the 9th Armored Division uh, that's sitting back there, and but they're for the pretty much the whole corps. That's going to be combat command B of the 9th. So no one's really thought through what happens if the Germans come at you with serious combat power. Well, this is just to, just to reaffirm this. This is what we were talking about earlier in this series is that, as we said, that, that, that they're expecting not much to happen. If there is something German going to happen, it's going to be something small and it's going to be something that whoever is facing it can handle on their own. What no one has anticipated is the size of this offensive and, and just how um, overwhelming it's going to be. And so, so yeah, it, there had been expectation of, of, of things happening because even if you're holding the line, you always do aggressive patrolling. That's that, that's you don't just sit there doing nothing. It's but both sides would want to be keeping themselves active and busy because of a keeping your morale of your troops up, b keeping the pressure on, and just it's good soldiering, just basic common sense. But the, but the size of this forthcoming attack was obviously what caught everybody out. Right, and what's funny is, is that that's what they're not doing, unfortunately, is they're not patrolling. They're going out every now and then and seeing some things, but they're not patrolling. I've got records of the 14th Cavalry Group saying, yeah, there are minefields in the Lushev Gap area. We're not quite sure where they all are. These guys have been here a month. Yeah. Uh, I mean, put on my professional hat for a second. That's inexcusable. <laughs> Uh, there, there's lots of things that are kind of beyond these guys' control, but, you know, like not knowing where the minefields are, very limited patrolling, and everyone's kind of going off the excuse of, well, it's a lightly held front, we're, uh, we're extended, the 106 has just shown up, no one's given thought to what an actual defensive plan looks like for this. So well, we haven't. The Allies haven't had to use a defensive plan of really any kind for six months. I mean, we we've, we've almost forgotten where we left those manuals. I mean, speaking metaphorically, but literally, you know, we have been no, on we, the front foot for right. for the best part of 1944. And, and and the belief is is that the German army is largely broken. There's not going to do anything left. It's all old men and little and kids now, and we're on our way to Berlin. There's that, that defense has has not been part of our real thinking. And what's funny is when they do think about where a counterattack is going to occur, and this is where actually, uh, you know, this is where my irony meter pegs a little bit, is that they think that the Hurtgen Forest is shielding a German armored counterattack force that will counterattack into the flank of 7th Corps as it crosses the Cologne Plain towards the Rhine. That's where they think the German counterattack is going to come. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? The Germans are masters at maneuver warfare. This is ground that makes sense for maneuver warfare. Uh, they've got tanks that have good long ranges that are designed to fight in big open areas. This kind of ground is not where you're going to do it. So this is the kind of situation they run up against. And I want to kind of highlight something there. You see this 18 CRS minus. That's because they've only got two troops actually there. Now they've got their assault gun battery and their tank company are there too. So it's really plus the AT battery, call it five companies worth of guys. Congratulations. What size frontage? Remind us what frontage? About five miles. Yeah. Uh, so, and you're not holding five miles with, call it four or 500 guys. <laughs> not effectively. The other troop, uh, the one that's missing, is down in the south. If you see down there where you, one regiment of the 18th Folks Grenadier, I've got the arrow, you like driving straight through them right there. Um, and that's a troop of 100 plus guys suddenly facing a regiment of, okay, these are Volks Grenadier regiments. They're not American infantry regiments, but they're still two to 3,000 soldiers easily. And 100 guys versus two to 3,000 guys, you can fight like warrior poets. You're, it's, it's not it's not going to turn out well for you. So on the morning of the 16th, when the Germans hit them, you notice that there's actually two separate divisions striking the 18th Cavalry Recon Squadron up there. And this is what's funny is we all think the Ardennes, it's German tanks, right? We, I don't know what it is we think about Germans. Germans always have tanks. Germans don't have as many tanks as you think they do. Or uh, this is mostly a dismounted infantry battle for the first several hours. 
there are assault guns present. There are tanks present. But this is predominant. The Germans are using their infantry, their Volksgrenadier divisions and their and the Fallschirmjäger to poke the, to to kind of punch the holes. So when this fight goes on, the Germans already have done. You're talking about aggressive patrolling. The Germans have done the aggressive patrolling. They know where the Americans are at on the front line. They don't necessarily know what's behind all the way, but they know what's on the front line there. And St. Bith is kind of the prize for the first day, which they, of course, they don't get to. Um, but, uh, and that's mostly due to traffic, uh, perhaps in many cases, than American resistance. Uh, there was a great uh, uh, show you did a couple of days ago on Lanzarath Ridge uh, with the 99th uh, Intel and Recon, Intel and Reconnaissance Squadron? I think that's what it is. Yeah, Iron, 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 yeah, yeah. Iron Arpleton, yeah. And, uh, which incidentally is right to the north of the uh, 18th uh, Recon Squadron right there. That's what's tying the 99th and the 18th together is that uh, INR platoon and the cavalry right there. So the, you kind of see that connection between the 5th Corps and the 8th Corps. So not only is it a unit boundary in terms of 99th Division and 106th Division, it's also the core boundary. That Middleton, and I want to say it's, I think it's still Hebner uh up in the north I'd, I'd have to go back and look and see who the fifth corps commander is right then and there so but this is a dismounted infantry fight where you've got isolated reinforced platoons of call it 40 50 guys and they've got machine guns and they've got armored cars like we talked about but they're not meant to fight in a static position the way the cavalry fights is they make contact and you bound back if you've got more, if they've got more combat power than you've got, you bound back. The problem is, is that you have to bound back to somebody. There's nobody there to bound back to. And they were so spread out that by the time you're bounding back, there's now an enemy behind you. And the worst thing you can do when you're being attacked is to get yourself out in the open ground. And all of a sudden now the enemy's got you out in the open and you're hoping to bound back to another position, but the position you're hoping to bound back to is now smashed. So at this point, in the 16, uh, morning of 16 December, the 18th Cab gets hit, and they get hit hard. And uh, if you want to go to that uh, line map, or the, uh, the kind of the drawing map, um, the, uh, the, the group commander tries to commit the 32nd Recon Squadron into the fight, thinking... I've, they're my reserve. I've got to save my squadron. The problem is, is that by the time the 32nd gets there, all they can do is hold their ground because, again, they're lightly armored. They're lightly uh, equipped. And there's only 700 or so of them. And they're facing five, six, seven thousand uh, German soldiers. And what ends up happening is, is that the cavalry is like, nope. We can we can hold, we can delay, but we can't win this. And the problem is, is there's no one to hand this fight off to. This is when Middleton suddenly realizes that he has a significant problem. When the 14th Cab Group basically calls up and goes, guys, we got ourselves a problem. Uh, this is also a problem where they come out, they start losing contact. I, I, the cavalry, I got my stats in up there on the, on the desk there, uh, you can kind of see. The 14th Cab does not cover themselves very heavily in glory here. There isn't a lot they can do, but they're not giving the, their commander the information. The commander of the 106th Infantry does not understand the situation. General Jones, he's out of, he does not understand that the Germans have uh, fully enveloped uh, two out of his three regiments. So, oh, but just to interrupt, this this is. This is par for the course on the whole front at this point. I mean, we, we made the point of Peter Caddick Adams on the Monday show is that we can now see these maps and we can see Sixth Panzer, Fifth, but we can see all these columns. We can see who's cut off, who's in danger of being cut off, who's ahead, who's behind. This is the benefit of a pilot compiling these maps after the battle had been done and dusted at the time. And we have to take in the terrain to, uh, in, in consideration the fact that you're on the opposite sides of complete hill ranges and valleys as well. There can be you could be hearing something happening five, ten miles to your north or south, but really be unaware exactly what's going on. And you're hearing distant gunfire. Is that our distant gunfire? Is it their gun? Distant gunfire? Are they holding? Are they moving? It's yeah. That overall state of 
confusion that lasted what 24 36 48 hours is is critical to, to understanding it's it, i can understand what you're saying we can put we can see now that maybe this commander didn't grasp the situation quick enough but you this is happening universally no one is really grasping the situation quick enough no and, and the, the big problem that you run into is the 14th cab is so hit is hit so hard that they basically dissolved as a fighting formation uh without you know uh, over the next two or three days you see the cavalry uh, this group uh, just get hit repeatedly and uh, this the group commander full colonel gets ambushed and uh, so uh, he barely escapes uh, like the jeep he's riding in is destroyed and the group xo is missing in action for uh, like 12 hours until he comes straggling back in what ends up happening is the group commander uh, finally hits his command post hands over to command uh, of uh, i want to say it's the 32nd recon squadron commander and then collapses I mean, he's evacuated as a non-battle casualty. I mean, it's a really kind of tragic story when you think about it. He's seen his entire command shredded in two to three days. And, uh, and uh, yeah, Colonel Devine. Uh, so, and, uh, but really, there isn't too much else that he can do right there. And uh, so what ends up happening is, is they, uh, they kind of put it, put themselves back together. They uh, tag in. They were part of the St. Vith. Uh, uh, they fight in the St. Vith pocket uh, in the goose egg. And they're finally withdrawn off the line there. And you pulled up uh, just the yeah, Tell us what this document is, then I'll show that I'll show the close up. But this this Say document again. is what? Remind us what the document is. Okay, so this is, uh, this is something I got from the National Archives. And this is actually the uh, unit after action report, which was typed up on 10 January 1945. And units would do these routinely. They do these monthly. And uh, they'd send up to their higher headquarters. And this is one of about three or four pages from that day or from that report for what they did in December. And you see there a total one out of every five officers was killed, wounded, or missing. One out of every three enlisted soldiers killed, wounded, or missing. Over half of their vehicles missing destroyed uh or destroyed abandoned uh captured and so this is what happens when you take a light cavalry formation and put it in the path of a massive uh attack and you don't have a plan and that's uh really kind of the moral of the story with the 14th cavalry group is not so much they got schwacked because they did that's a technical term by the way schwacked uh is that there was no plan in place for what happens when the Germans attack in mass. Because again, and this is where we, we, when you did your um, Civil War introduction, we talked about Buford at Gettysburg, and he had to hold there. He he knew that there was a, a limit on how long he'd have to hold because there would be that core arriving behind him. In this situation, the poor old Fourteenth. It's they don't know when they're going to anyone else is going to come and they're, they're holding. They can hold for a bit. They can hold for a few hours. Maybe they can hold for But with the overwhelming onslaught coming towards them with no actual plan behind them, it's only unfortunately going to end one way, isn't it? Uh, yeah, th this is this is a case where it's like you're, you're kind of reaping the all the. Uh, the penalties of a bad of bad planning, I mean, the Allied High Command took and Eighth Corps took a risk in this sector because you've got to be strong someplace, right? I mean, and yeah. the and the entire 12th Army Group has culminated, which is, you know, it's a doctrinal term, but it means that the unit can't go any farther. It must stop. It re must reorganize. It must recuperate. You had an entire Army Group that had basically culminated at the end of November, beginning of December. Hmm. No one's thinking, gee, Middleton needs to tighten up his shot group down there in the Ardennes. And what's interesting is, is that when Middleton moved his headquarters to the Ardennes, he knew he had a problem. And this is in, this is in October of 44. Uh, General Simpson, who commanded the 9th Army, originally had responsibility for that area. Middleton had his core headquarters in Bastogne. And, and Simpson goes, dude, that's kind of far back for you. I mean, are you what's going on? Middleton says, I have nothing between my core headquarters and the enemy but distance and terrain. So he knew there was a problem. 
they just um, didn't. We, we had the question from, um, from my friend Dave Collins, who's a Gettysburg guy, but or get Gettysburg expert, friend of mine, long time friend. Yeah. So Dave is asking, did Colonel Devine ask for a plan? And, and are we getting back? Because when you talked about they're arriving there, they're under strength, they're spread out, it's five miles, blah, blah, blah. But we're also talking about the fact that there isn't an expectancy of anything large happening. So if he'd had a bigger idea of something brewing the other side of the border there, would he maybe have pressed more for what is the plan? Because moving into that size area, five miles with the strength he had, is asking for trouble, but it's not asking for trouble if you're not expecting trouble. So is it also this benefit of, of everybody's in this situation where they're not expecting anything? So it's like me saying, if I had a house in um, in Scotland, I'm unlikely to be hit by a tropical score, storm because tropical storms don't happen in Scotland. If I was in the Caribbean, a tropical storm is more likely. So in this situation, on the, on in this and this, you know, and beginning of or middle of December, theoretically something could happen, but it's so unlikely to happen. I'm not going to really worry about the fact there isn't a plan B. Is that kind of a story here? Yeah, and and to directly answer the question, yes, Divine had actually gone to the 106th Infantry Division because he was attached to them and said, "Hey, what's the plan?" And the plan is, well, guys, um, hold what you got. You have a squadron in reserve. Use them if you need them. It's and, kind of a bit of a don't worry about it kind of situation, isn't it? it you know, don't worry about it because it's not going to happen. Don't don't well, don't fuss because this isn't going to happen. When Jones arrived, the Second Infantry Division commander, whom he's relieving, kind of pats him on the back and says, "Hey, man, you lucked out. Easy sector. Don't worry. The Germans ain't doing anything." Uh, and so uh, it's fascinating from that perspective of you know, if you're the new guy. And you're kind of unsure. And remember, the 106th Infantry Division is the last division that the U.S. Army mobilizes. Yeah. And so if you're the new guy and this old salt pats you on the back and says, nothing to worry about here. Should he have had a plan? Yeah, he should have. Um, now, Jones, of course, is a tragic character. I mean, his one of his son, I think his son was uh in one of the surrounded regiments so he's freaking out about his son who's going to be a pow uh, he actually ends up having a heart attack um uh he has to be relieved uh afterwards uh so there's a lot to feel sorry for the guy in that regard i mean this is not a case where you're where you're set up for success mm -hmm. in that particular case Philip De Preto made a good comment here. Screening those five miles shouldn't be a problem, but holding. And that's a that's a really good way of summing it up, isn't it? You know, just having a little look. OK, holding against a, a, an onslaught. It's a very different prospect. And this this comes back to this. They've got lots of things they can do well, but this isn't one of them. This is not on the list. They've got an extraordinary list of things they can do well, mobile and reconnaissance and security and flank protection. We could just list all the things they can do well. But in this engagement, this is absolutely what they can't do well. Right. Um, so the next question, we obviously got lots more to talk about, but in, in the general, our general understanding of the Ardennes campaign, and it's, it's been a recurring theme, these few programs, is that there's a lot. There's a few things we know a lot about. We know about Lanzarath Ridge. We know about the Iron Arbiter. We know about the Baston and the 101st. We know about Patton sending up Fourth Armor Division from the south. Beyond of those things, oh, we know about Piper's Column, and we know about the the tragic massacre massacres at Malmedy and Wereth and uh, Stavelo. But to me, apart from our knowledgeable viewers here on World War Two TV, the cavalry group hold, attempting holding this seems to have fallen a bit through the cracks. So as obviously a big fan of cavalry, you are a cavalryman, this is your thing. Why aren't the generalist historians talking about this more? Because it always happens on the side. Uh, it, it's always the, the, the side stuff. Uh, and now the 14th cavalry group gets a little bit more press than say some of the other cavalry groups do in in the in the in the bulge um uh because of course they set up the the famous honor uh, sur uh surrender of the 106 two well yeah. two regiments of the 106 so it gets a little bit more press but it's always kind of on the side it's before it's after it's uh to the flanks and quite frankly, a lot of it is, is just, we don't like to talk about these, uh, when, when people are trying to write about it, they're trying to kind of, trying to zero in on something. And it's kind of, 
you know, what's the term? It's more sexy. Uh, it, you know, it, it grabs readers. Um, I've got a great, uh, you know, patent sells books, right? Yeah. So uh, you put patent on everything. Well, but the problem is when you put patent on there because it sells books and people like buying books about patent. I mean, would you buy a book? That, would you immediately grab a book off the shelf that said divine? Uh well, th th yeah, th this is the, this again. We we talked about that with Don yesterday. Uh, you know, General Wood not getting as much attention as other people, and you know, the, the conclusion we came up with yesterday is that the Fourth Armor Division, being under Patton's command, everything he does, they are in his shadow, R rightly or wrongly. Um, it, it's the same with it's like MacArthur. You can't talk about the Philippines without MacArthur coming into conversation. And 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 sometimes some really able commanders who are junior to these very famous people, they're just not being talked about. But yeah. so they, they uh, going back to some of the other. You, you talked about these other units that are beyond the 14th, and I just put the quote up there from one of our viewers there about the other unit, the fourth and the 102nd. So what's happening to the other cavalry groups? What are their okay, so experiences? Okay, so let's go back and uh, let's go back to that uh, Google Earth image that I had with uh, like the Fifth Corps for, on it for the most part. Uh, yeah, so what you see up there up the top of the screen is the 38th uh, Recon Squadron up in Monshaw. And again, morning the 16th, they're hit. Now, this is, we don't get to read a lot about this, although this is the northern, this is the beginning of the northern shoulder of the bulge. And the German operation here this is what's called a shaping operation and by the definition it's it shapes the battlefield right for the main effort and the 326 volks grenadier plus a couple of its uh, uh, sister organizations its job is to seize monchau and get as far west as it can in order to uh basically cut off the uh lines of supply and lines of communication to the second and 99th ids you cut those locks, all of a sudden, now instead of one division cut off, you now have three divisions cut off. Now, the 2nd and 99th divisions are some pretty salty divisions. I think that they would have done something a little bit different than the, what the 106 did. Be that as it may, you take Monchau and maybe even the, Ver uh, please forgive my pronunciation, Vervier Malmody St. Vithro, you're able to cut that or put fires on that um, the Americans have a significant problem and the northern shoulder of the bulge looks very, very different. So they get hit first thing in the morning. The difference being is that the, the Germans do not have this massive, overwhelming numerical superiority. And the 30th Recon Squadron, in a straight up defense, they also have, they've really thought through their defense. They have lots of artillery backing them up. They've got the, they're tied in closely with the 99th ID and they just cut them to shreds, which is lucky for them because they didn't really have any place to go. Uh, because if you look at that train right behind them, you're not taking vehicles into that very effectively. Yeah, it's just it's thick forest, isn't it? And 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 inclines, yeah. yeah Bad so, country. So the 30th recon squadron fights, and it's it's a day and a half. The 326 tries. The, uh, on the 16th, and they try again on the 17th. It's a um, total of like eight different attacks. And it's some pretty vicious fighting here. So we talked about the cavalry, you know, that they uh, they don't have a lot of manpower. That, but this is a case of when they are in a frontage that they can hold. And they are well supported because they've got massive amounts of artillery. Because bear in mind, the 5th Corps had just been in the middle of, a, of, a, of an offensive. So the 78th Infantry Division, I think it was, that was attacking to the north, getting up to the Ruhr River dams. All that artillery that was supporting that attack just kind of orient south a little bit. And they stopped that attack cold. Not a, It's not the decisive moment of the Battle of the Bulge. It's not the, oh, my God, this is it right here moment. But if, that bat, if they don't hold, this battle looks very, very different. So this is kind of an example of a recon squadron able to resist. Now, there's factors going for it. The Germans aren't committing nearly as much combat power. Two, the 38th recon squadron was a little bit saltier of an organization. These guys are guys that came ashore with 5th Corps shortly after D-Day. They've been, uh, they fought in Normandy, and they uh, uh, mentioned these are the guys that have been uh, helped liberate Paris. They fought the whole way forward. So these guys are pretty... 
experienced and they know how to and experienced in lots of different things as well i mean that that there are there are some units that have fought their way across france but they've been repeating a lot of the same types of actions the variety of of engagements these cavalry units have is is extraordinary isn't it as we say from protection to flanking to scouting to they and, and in different terrains as well i mean they are as as any as anybody can be by the winter of 44 they are masters of what they do i would argue yep. like like don was making the same point about fourth armor the sc they've got to about as fine an edge as you can hone a unit to and they haven't had I mean, after the bulge, they're going to, you know, we talked about the, the, the 14th and their losses of officers and men. They're, they're going to be a very different force in the next chapter because they've lost so much experienced personnel and they've somewhat lost so much equipment. But at this point here, they're, they're about as at a peak, as great a peak as you can put anyone, I suppose. Yeah, and uh, this is just a case of where the Germans and... But we also have to give the and we and this is where it's interesting. You talk about oh, they're Volksgrenadier, they're old men and young boys. Not necessarily. Uh, the Volksgrenadier divisions too are these are divisions that have been formed around cadres of Eastern Front veterans. These are divisions yeah. that have been d- destroyed on the Eastern Front effectively. But there's a solid core of people still left to make the unit the unit, because uh, it's like when a new guy shows up to a unit, if it's a brand new unit. That unit is not very effective because everyone's still kind of learning each other. If you've got a solid cadre of people that know what they're about and know what they're doing, you can hang all sorts of old men and young boys and new draftees into an organization. And they're going to be a much more effective organization than you might otherwise think them to be. So uh, now the, this is the, the similar point Greg Way was making about the ninth voucher maker. You know, yeah, no. there are a lot of new guys, but there are there are hardcore of experienced NCOs and non commons And when we talk about the the the, the other, you know, the units we're talking about, we're talking about uh, still decent numbers of machine guns, assault rifles, some some modern kits they've got there. Because as we know, we talked about Peter Caddick Adams. Although the, the whole German offensive is fatally flawed, they are putting a lot of their new shiny kit in it. And I want you to reference it back then. You know, the, we talk about there not being that many tanks, but the Germans, as Peter said, are making sure they take photos of their King Tigers and things like that. And they're not allowing the press to take photos of the 50,000 horses that were bringing up the rear, towing up all the artillery. But the guys in those spearhead divisions have got a lot of ki- nice shiny kit. Um, and, and enough experience there, so that yeah, I don't think we should just dismiss them as being old guys because that's 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 a false false. Uh, which goes into kind of you know one of, I know one of the themes you've been kind of pushing here is is that we we tend to think of oh well the Germans we only tend to think of the Germans in one of two ways one they're like the SS supermen right you know the guy that yeah. can you know l- you know leap tall buildings in one bound or uh, what's actually what what's really proper the Volkssturm uh, which is that's truly the the kids with the uh, with that the that is form. the dregs yeah that that's uh, that's a misunderstanding of those two terms Volkssturm and Volks Volks um, uh, um yeah but, there, but there's a lot of kind of middle ground here so that's this is kind of a long way around to saying is that the 38th recon squadron's got a got to fight on its hands but the conditions are the fifth corps organized it better and the re and it's a more experienced squadron and the germans are less effective so uh the question is did you want to go north or south to talk about fourth or the sixth because uh, i mean that's really kind of the story for the 38th it's a short story Both. But- let's do which which map do you want you want uh okay let's talk fourth uh let's talk to fourth cab uh, for a second so yeah so what's interesting now the the story here is you got to look at how the u.s army organizes in world war ii which is you have these core headquarters, which are these, it's basically a headquarters. There's no, lo, there's no long standing. This division belonged to this core kind of organization. Uh, it's a, a, attached as opposed to assigned. Assigned is you belong. Attached is you're working with them. Yeah. And there's other definitions we don't need to get into. Um, but so what ends up happening is, is that the fifth core is kind of holding that northern shoulder of the bulge. But the Germans are kind of streaming past him. So the very first thing that Eisenhower does is he takes the 18th Airborne Corps, which is kind of sitting on its heels, and he says, you tie in to the west edge of Fifth Corps. 
And they go, great, who do we got? And like, well, you have the 30th Infantry Division, and there's a couple more guys that come in as a, and then you got the 7th Armored Division, which was originally fighting under 8th Corps, but then 8th Corps loses kind of all semblance of coherence. So 18th Corps kind of fills in. So bear in mind, these are divisions getting pulled from other corps and other field armies. We talked about the 10th Armored Division yesterday, where Patton's grumbling that he's losing his armored division. Hodges calls Simpson, commander of the 9th Army, and goes, eh, paraphrasing, hey, man, I got problems. And Simpson says, hey, man, what you need? Says, whatever you can send me. Simpson gives a warno to the 7th Armored Division, basically where he hangs up the phone before lunch on the 16th. By midnight, the 7th Armored Division is moving. Think about that for a second. That You're moving an entire armored division, which is... 13, 14,000 people. Uh, and uh, and you're getting them all, and you're and you figured out how to get them on roads, move them south. That is a massive deal. So, anyways, they're coming south. Well, the Germans are still streaming west. So, Seventh Corps, Seventh Corps had been fighting up around Aachen. At that point, Collins is told, pull out of the line. You're going south. Who? Great. Who do I got? You got the second armored division and, and some other guys. Great. When do I meet him? When you get there. So Collins goes, okay, great. So what's the situation look like there? Like, we don't know. There are Germans somewhere to the west of 18th Airborne Corps driving, we think, to the Meuse River. Figure it out. So Collins grabs his core cavalry group, which is assigned as opposed to attached. It's his core troops, which is the 4th Cavalry, and says, hey, 4th Cavalry. Go to this grid location and tell me what's there because I have no clue. I don't need you to talk about, you know, uh, all these forests, the valleys, the mist. Aerial recon's getting through. It's not getting through. Um, and he says, I know the Germans here, you know, look at the map. Here there be Germans somewhere. Cavalry, tell me what's there. Classic cavalry mission. So the second, so the fourth cavalry arrives, and you can kind of see there on the left hand, uh, left hand side of the map, you see Haverson, and the fourth cavalry shows up, and the very first thing that happens is they uh, run into a German reconnaissance formation, and well, I mean, you found the enemy, the enemy finds you. Bottom line is you've made contact, um, and that gives Collins information. Okay, we've made contact, because it's not just you make contact with Germans. What have you made contact with? Okay, it's German, uh, it's German armor. It's German mechanized infantry. Okay, great. What do we know that's out there? Well, we know that if, if we see a mixture of tanks, half tracks, and all these kind of guys, all of a sudden, that keys us, okay, well, who's got that? Oh, we have a panzer division out there. Uh, and then, because uh, if you see assault guns, trucks, and infantry, okay, I've got a Volksgrenadier division in front of me, or I have something else, uh, or a Fallschirmjäger, you know, a uh, Fallschirmjäger would be wearing different uniforms too, which would be helpful. So the cavalry is giving him this information, it's helping him develop this fight uh, to understand what's going and on. We're back to the roads again, aren't we? We're back to that inability in the Ardennes to just shift people over. And I'm from Normandy, and I, I always bring it back to Normandy because that's what I do. And La Manche, which is the bit that goes from Carenton up to, Car uh, to Cherbourg, is one of the smaller departments of France, but it has the second longest mileage of roads of any French department. There's seven, eight, ten ways of getting from every town to every other town, because if you can't take one, the Ardennes is different. We're talking valleys, and we're talking hills, and we're talking logging tracks so in this situation if you're if you're collins and lawton collins is for my money one of my favorite commanders of world war ii and i want to do a show about him at some point if you've got an armor division and you've got an infantry division you've got other forces knowing which one to send down which road because you've got which enemy ahead of you is absolutely vital because you can't just shift them at the last minute on that road network so this is where Finally, cavalry is using it is, is being used for its absolute primary purpose. What's there, and who is it, and what do we need to do about it? And, and more to the point, and, and, and uh, just to build off that a little bit more, it's where can I hit them? Yeah, uh, because it's not just yeah, there's enemy out there, so let's just Leroy Jenkins into them. Uh, it's it's more it's okay. It's where is the enemy developing? So. 
so where can I mask? Because what you want to do is after you found the enemy, now you figure out, okay, where is he not? Uh, what does he start to look like? And this is, you know, the way to do it is to kind of run and sometimes just run into him. Um, and if you look just uh, south of Haverson, you see uh, the town of Humane, uh, which uh, uh, if you if you're looking at the map is just to the south of the 24th, 4th, uh, there 24th Squadron, 4th Cavalry Group. And uh, you see a bunch of red arrows there. Collins is just, tr is he's still trying to figure this thing out. He says, hey, I want you to go to Humane. Try and get to Humane. Tell me what's there. And so the 4th Cavalry Group goes, all right, let's go. And they take the, they take the time pretty fit, pretty quickly. What they don't realize is that that is one of the primary logistic routes for the 2nd Panzer Division, which is trying mm -hmm. to still go west. So all of a sudden, the, the Germans react rather violently to this. And at that point, the, the, they get kicked out of the town, and there's a swirling battle, a series of battles around there. And he starts sending a combat command over uh, of the 2nd Armored Division over to Humane, because he's like, now, oh, that town's important. Let me put more combat power there. Let me see what else I can do. And uh, so at a certain point, he realizes, okay, this the Germans are dug in too deep here. Let me go someplace else. But again, it's the whole find the enemy, develop the situation, kind of help the help your uh, do this. Because again, 2nd Armored Division's only got depending on how you do it, two or three combat commands. Uh, uh, who was it? Uh, Mr. Fox? Uh, 4th Armored Division. Uh, when he was talking yeah. about, yeah, the 4th Armored Division typically would only fight with two, but really you, you've got three. But really what it works out to is, is that there's only nine battalions in an armored division. Three tank battalions, three mech infantry battalions, three artillery battalions. Mix and match them however you like. But that's it. That's all you got. Now, the 2nd Armored Division actually has more. They've got two full regiments of armor and, an, and a regiment of infantry, one of two heavy divisions still left in the U.S. Army, the 2nd and the 3rd. Uh, so they had six battalions of armor, three battalions of infantry. But again, figure out where to place that weight, where to put that fist. So that's what the 4th Cavalry is going to do for them. Um, now, as you as we progress after Christmas, because you Christmas is kind of our dividing line, right? You know, Bastogne's yeah. really relieved on the 26th. Never know mine. Patton's a day late, right? Uh, boxing. We'll call it Boxing Day. Uh, and um, so when the 7th Corps begins their counterattack south, the 4th Cavalry Group is not going to be in the lead there because they've already made contact with the enemy. They've already developed. They know what's in front of them. So what they're doing is now they're going to shift over to the flank and maintain connection with British 30 Corps, because of what you see off to the what you would see if, with the left hand of this map is that's where British 30 Corps is coming in, yeah. and that's where you want to connect pieces because seams are important. We saw this with the 14th Cavalry Group. You want to hit people on a seam when at all possible. You never want to square up on your opponent if you can help it. Yeah, and you never want. Uh, but by the same token, you want your enemy squared up on you. You don't want your enemy hitting a seam because uh, a seam is where two units are connecting. Who's in charge of that middle ground, right? And uh, which is the Falaise gap in a nutshell? Of, <laughs> uh, is this mine or yours? Yeah, that's that. And, and trying to figure it out who's got artillery uh, because uh, boundaries are what we call coordinated fire lines, which is you're not allowed, or actually, they're restrictive fire lines. You're not allowed to shoot over it at all. Typically, we make them coordinated fire lines and you just call up the other guy and say, hey, are you clear? But it's harder, right? Because you can see your guys. You know if your guys are there. Are you shooting at a friendly or an enemy? It's hard to tell. So that's what those cavalry groups are doing is they're stitching together those seams for the allied forces on the uh, when they're on the attack. And they don't need their light guys out front because they've made contact. They're grinding forward because cavalry's not designed for that. But now they're stitching together those seams where now if the enemy starts to make a showing there, the cavalry can kind of spot that and alert you, kind of give you that early warning. 
and then, yeah, this is all about the mobility again, isn't it? And uh, which is just so fascinating. And people are loving it. We've got the the next map. This is the old, the classic widening of the Baston Corridor. Because this is now, is this the hundred and second now? I think we're talking about. Uh no, this is the sixth uh, down yeah, here. Sorry, yeah, that's right. So the hundred and second are with Fifth Corps, and they kind of have their one moment of glory up at Monchau, and then they pretty much sit the rest of the war uh, trying to stay warm. Uh, not the rest of the war, but the rest, of, the rest of this battle. Now, what's interesting is, is that. We talked about the 4th Armored Division assaulting into uh, Bastogne. And the problem is, is that 4th Armored Division is a light armor division. Three tank, three mech, three artillery. And a recon squadron, too, which is often forgotten to be included in those numbers. Um, the, and then you got the 26th Infantry Division over to the right. The problem that they're encountering is the Germans, as they're attacking to Bastogne, the Germans are putting up a lot of resistance. And the problem is, is that you don't want to leave your flank wide open. Bad things in capital letters happen to you with it if you leave your uh, rear flank open because your supplies trucks are coming up and we love our loggies, but we don't, we, we don't want them to fight, right? Uh, and so they're trying to, so the 4th Armored Division's got to kind of keep an eye out to the left flank because they know there are Germans somewhere out there. They also know there's scattered elements of the 28th Infantry still out there. It's a mess. No one knows what's out there. Here there be dragons, right? <laughs> Something's out there. We don't know what. So they kind of kept keep an eye off to their left-hand side the whole time. And the 6th Cavalry Group, which is 3rd uh, Corps Cavalry, had actually started out the war, uh, or had actually started out the campaign just east of Metz. And it's kind of funny. They're a group that they, they were sitting still. They'd worked for 20th Corps for a while. They were actually Patton's Information Service, which is a whole other story, uh, which we can talk about another time. Uh, basically, they would ride around and uh, do, uh, if you're familiar with Montgomery's uh, spies, his messenger system. It's a very similar concept, but for Patton. Um, so they've been inserted. They're working for the 20th Corps, with 12th Corps, excuse me. 12th Corps got pushed north, so they worked for 20th Corps. 20th Corps, then, uh, or no, then, and then, the, so they ended up getting shifted over to 3 Corps. They changed Corps headquarters like three or four times. It's ridiculous. And they didn't move an inch. So 3 Corps is going north to, to fight this. And 3 Corps is supervising the attack. Now, remember, we talked about the Corps are just modular headquarters. 20th Corps is pitching divisions over to 3 Corps as they're getting them. And the 4th Armored Division is one of those divisions. Because uh, if you go back to the Nancy campaign and whatnot, 4th Armored had been part of 12th Corps. And so 4th Armored Division's got a problem of they need to get to Bastogne. It's turning into a hard slugging match. And they need to kind of concentrate their power, but they also have to watch their left flank. So what it is on Christmas Day, they call up their core cavalry group and go, guys, get up here. We need you. And what it is, is they send one squadron off to the right-hand side uh, or to the eastern side of 4th Armored, and they're linking up with 26th Infantry. Again, seams. You don't want to, uh, so the, the cavalry can, because of mobility, they can expand. They're kind of like that accordion, right? So long as, you know, you don't have like three divisions strike you all at once, right? It's like, a, like, a, like connecting armies with a bungee cord is the analogy exactly. I just came up with in my head. No, but it's it's very apropos and very correct. And then on the left hand side, you have the six cavalry group go over there, and they're basically told, "Guys, we don't know what's out here. There's Americans, there's Germans. We're not quite sure where. So uh, go figure it out." And so what you see is a combat command R, which is being used in this case as a regular uh, combat command is taken from the left flank because they've been moved over to North Chateau. And again, please forgive my pronunciation. And then they then Combat Command R is then pulled from that flank mission and then sent north. And they're the guys that, of course, get to Bastogne. Now, again, was the 6th Cavalry Group the reason why 4th Armored Division broke through? No. Is the reason they maybe broke through on the 26th? Possibly. But what you see is, again, supporting efforts. And this is why, of course, no one writes stories about the 6th Cavalry Group, because the 4th Armored Division is the guy that actually does it. Yeah. Uh, the 6th yeah. Cavalry doesn't really Always do the bridesmaids, never armor. the bride, um, kind of, isn't it, as well? Um, yeah. Now, the 6th and... Cavalry Group actually does get a presidential unit citation out of this battle, but not for this event. Uh, this has a great map here. So 
you see the what's called the this is uh the Harlange pocket, which is just to the southeast of Bastogne. And the Germans are holding this ground very, very effectively. And they're trying to close up, they're trying to close this gap, and everything they've thrown at this gap at this uh front fails. And what ends up happening is the Sixth Cavalry Group is originally inserted into the line predominantly to hold line so that infantry divisions can concentrate their regiments elsewhere. The group commander sees an opportunity. He's like, wait a minute. I think I can pull something. And so he assaults into the, into the, into the center of this uh, line. And because he's got just enough armor protection, again, this ain't stopping an 88. This ain't stopping a 75. But the number 88s out there and the number 75s out there are pretty limited. So he's going to use just enough. He's got just enough firepower, just enough armor protection and a lot of mobility that he's able to kind of, you know, uh, pull the um, what is the Muhammad Ali, you know, uh, um, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Move in and he's able to use that mobility to create effect. And what that does is then that dislocates the German defenses, because when you look behind you and all of a sudden there's an American armored car there, even though it's an armored car. And if you stopped and thought about it for a minute, you could probably handle it. It kind of freaks you out. Right. You've got yeah. Americans to your front. Now you got Americans behind you. So the entire pocket starts collapsing and then they attack from the other side. Not the uh, this is another American infantry division and the whole pocket collapses. So the so the Sixth Cavalry actually gets a presidential unit citation out of this. And for those that may not be familiar, presidential unit citation is a citation that is if a unit if if, if a unit had been an individual, it would have been actions that would have been worthy of a Medal of Honor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of a way of thinking about it is that a unit went above and beyond in order to uh, to do this. And one of only a very hand, I mean. This is the largest land campaign that the United States Army will ever fight. Fight. So there are a number of presidential unit citations, but they're still fairly rare. Uh, so, and they're not very often awarded to supporting effort formations. Yeah, they go. They go to the to the to the, the main guys. We're, we're we're getting to the point where I want to ask a couple of questions there. So, the Great Dominion, who's a big show fan, I think I know the answer. This is myself. Can you address the story about the M8 Greyhound taking out a Tiger tank at close range? from the rear during the Ardennes fighting? Was that fact or fiction? Um, it probably happened. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I say that just because I'm not familiar with that precise story, but it, there's a, there are enough stories that are out there. What's actually, and this is one of those uh, apocryphal stories that we uh, that I've seen in any number of cases, there's actually a story about an M8 that actually takes out a, uh, I believe it's a Tiger. I've heard, I've also re re read it be a Panther. I've read it be a, uh, a Panzer IV. There's one thing American soldiers in World War II were really bad at. It was armored vehicle. Oh my weapons. God, yes. Recognition. Yeah. Oh <laughs> God, yes. Yeah. Everything's Every tank's a Tiger. Every gun's an 88. Yeah. God, don't, uh, don't, don't get me started, Bill. Where they shot down the tube and the breach happened to be open and it penetrated the, the turret from there. I've heard that story a number of times. So it's one of those that, okay, it probably came from someplace, right? So mm. now could it have been they shot it and someone else, like a P-40, like a P-47 shot it from the sky? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, these things happened. A lot of times knocking out is a very odd term too. Because yeah. if you've got a 37 millimeter and I have to fight a tiger, first off, you have to tell me I have to fight it. Because if I see a tiger show up and I've got this, the first thing I'm going to do is use a, what I call OPB, other people's bullets. Yeah. I'm going to use artillery. I'm going to use airstrikes. I'm going to call for heavier tanks. I'm going to do everything in the world to not fight this myself. But if I do have to fight it, I'm going to go for his tracks or his engine. Because if I all I have to do is knock out, you know, pop a track. And that's actually fairly easy to do um hit a road wheel pop the track get something into the engine and okay that gun's still there that turret's still there but now he's a pillbox yeah 
And at a certain point, those soldiers are going to have to get out of that tank. Now, the question is, is what else is going to happen there? Now, once I stop him, am I going to then maneuver around? Can I get some infantry up to throw a satchel charge in there? Do I, can I just bypass him? Um, there's lots of things that you can do past that point. So am I familiar, you know, I'd have to go back and through the records and find the, uh, see if there's a case of an inmate knocking out a tiger. I would say that given the number of inmates that are available, did it happen somewhere in the spike? I mean, it, again, it's, it, yeah, I think you're, you're correct. It's the knocking out, isn't it? Because I mean, I get that in Normandy with an event like bloody Gulch June the 13th, where you have stugs and things that get disabled by perhaps a guy with a grenade or a guy with a bazooka. But then later on, second armor to come through. And if they see a tank or SPG sitting, they, they whack a shot at it. And so when the guy takes a photo of it five days later, there's a really big hole that gets counted as being the one that knocked it out. But it might have actually been the bit of track that's damaged that actually stopped the tax. There's stopping, disabling, knocking out, destroying. I mean, there's several levels where it gets there. Now, we did a conversation, had a chat, someone asked a question ages ago on this on the thread about the M8's mobility off-road, and it wasn't terribly good. Is that something you've got an experience of? Because obviously, with the M5 Stuart, it's tracked. It's kind of can go everywhere. Uh, my my experience of being with M8s is that they're, they're, they are a bit weird on muddy ground. Is that something that you've come across? Um, yeah, the, uh, they don't like taking them off-road if they can. Uh, typically, what you're going to see if they, if they truly have to go, and there's also off-road and there's off-road, right? Yeah. Uh, which is, are we talking muddy ground? Are we talking hard ground? Are we talking up certain slopes? Uh, the M8 is, does not have the same cross-country cross mobility as a tank. There's really no way it can. Um, uh, and that gets into a, a, a matter of ground pressure. Uh, which is basically on a tank with a track, you're distributing that weight over a wider track. Yeah. That's why you want a, a, the wide, uh, the, uh, as wide a base as you can on your tracks. Um, with When you have wheels, you even on a six-wheeled car like this, you're spreading it out over six, which is still good, but that's six individual points. So there's yeah. six points where you can sink into the ground at any of those points. So... In, you know, in a vacuum, a tracked vehicle is almost always going to be more maneuverable off-road than a wheeled vehicle. And now I will tell you that the M8 had a little bit better. Uh, it, it's one of those that it was a little bit better than the, than the Jeep, but not much. Because what it made up for in terms of it's got six wheels, it's got a little bit bigger engine, it's also heavier. Yeah, Jeep has that kind of skipping over stuff, um, off-road capability, whereas the M8, I'm, having been in them, it, when it goes down, it goes down into it and it can sink really, really quickly. I've seen lots of photos on these commemorative trips of people having to dig out M8s that just go off into a ditch and it's suddenly it's buried itself almost. Oh, yeah. Uh, they, they go, when they go down, they go down. But another question I'm going to ask as well is, is when we think of certain units in World War II and even not just World War II, we think of certain formations like Roman legions with their shields, their tortoises. Is there like a classic way of deploying m8s or is it too fluid because of the number of jobs they can do but when i'm thinking about you're know, talking about the moving in there the fourth and the sixth and the whole moving in and you're is there do they keep them together do they spread them out is there a kind of is it is it there are too many different formations to kind of list them all really um it, it all depends and i'm gonna you know use that old uh standby that i i always use as a lieutenant which is uh sir it's met tc dependent which stands for mission, enemy train, time available, and uh, troops. So basically, it depends. It's the Army way of saying it depends. Um, but uh, what's, what's interesting about the M8, though, is, is that oftentimes what you will see is that if they're operating as a section, which is uh, what you will see is like a, you got the two Jeeps and then the, and the M8, is that the M8 is generally like the, like the fire support vehicle. So it's kind of standing back a little bit because it's got the range to kind of uh, hit folks. And then uh, the other guys are going to kind of dismount from their Jeeps. Um, oftentimes, the way the cavalry groups would fight, the, particularly the when, these, when they had to fight uh, a kind of a, a pitched battle, is they would organize is they would kind of stable a lot of their vehicles uh this goes back to the old uh um 
uh, concept of, you know, the horse holders, right? You know, yeah, one man yeah. out of every four holding the horses. What they do is they just kind of motor pull a bunch of vehicles to give them a whole bunch of dismounts. And then they ride forward often on things like M8s. And that's because you can, is the, the crew and the M8 can stay in one place. You can, you know, hang a bunch of guys on it. You know, like you've seen all those member things, you know, guys like to ride in vehicles. You can just, you can throw more people on an M8. And you would use those to kind of move up to the front a little bit. And then they dismount and the M8s are there providing fire support because also an M8's got more survivability. You can yeah. shoot a 50 cal off a Jeep, but you're just, I mean, uh, you're Audie Murphying it, right? <laughs> you know, you're just standing up there for all the world for somebody to, shot, to shoot at. Um, whereas an M8, okay, yeah, to shoot the 50 cal, you got to stand up, but you've got the 37 millimeter and you got the coax, uh, 30 caliber. Uh, so that's a little bit more protected. Uh, I, I if I'm going to shoot at someone, I like to have a little bit of armor plate between me and someone again, tanker by trade. So, <laughs> uh, so that's how they would do it is, is that the inmates would kind of provide the fire support and your dismounted guys who would typically ride in Jeeps would then clear the objective. Now that means that after you're done, people got to go back and get the vehicles. Uh, and you don't want to leave your vehicles alone too long because um, you're familiar with the old saw, there's only one thief in the army. Everyone else is just trying to get his stuff back. Um, <laughs> you don't want to leave your stuff unintended for too long. So, but yeah, it, it, there were a lot of different ways in which they fought and it all kind of depended on how they would do it. Uh, like when in Germany in 45, they create these little task forces and they attach a company of rangers to a cavalry squadron. And uh, basically every platoon would get every or every company or troop would get a platoon of rangers and the rangers would just kind of hang on to the vehicles. And if they hit, uh, if they hit the resistance in a German town, the cavalry would kind of stand off, provide fire support and the rangers would go in and clear the town because we're talking small, like small towns, right? Like 10, 15, mm uh building kind of towns and they would do that so again it really kind of all depends um and it, it goes back to what you were saying earlier about the the fact they can do so many different things they have this mobility and this this bungee cord between between um units and things that having some standard way of going into war would be too restrictive i mean you have to an infantry company has to have its kind of out of the box standard parade ground tactics of you know left platoon, first platoon moves this the flanking but but with this kind of thing you 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 as you say it's going to be so different depending on the terrain the weather which enemy what your mission is that day um to, to force them into one style would be would be restrictive so we'll, we'll kind of bring things to an end fairly soon any more kind of standard lessons you should give our audience about cavalry the use of them in the ETO kind of a couple of takeaways people should have about to, to you know, to go and consider when they finish the show. Um, kind of a couple of, I'll, I'll start with the doctrinal ideas and then move towards the world war two ideas. So kind of the doctrinal ideas being is, is that you're always going to have to fight for information because you're, there's no perfect technological way to find out enough of what you need to know about what's in front of you what ground is in front of you, what the, what the enemy is doing, what the enemy is trying to do. And the enemy is going to try very hard to stop you from doing it. Um, and it might just be their scouts. Um, and that become, that's because no one's just going to wave at you and go, hi, best of luck. Uh, no, they're, they're going to try very hard to kill you uh, or to do something bad to you to prevent you from finding out the information you were sent to find out. So, and what's interesting is you see this idea take off. I mean, we have armored cavalry regiments in one form or another all the way up until, um, I forget when they uh, call it 2011 is when we uh, dismount, is when we uh, reflag the third uh, armored cavalry regiment, my old regiment, uh, the one that I went to war with, and uh, turned them into a striker infantry, a striker infantry regiment. Now they still have the the flag, the Third Armored Cavalry Regiment, but they're not really man trip to equip, man trip to organize, man trip to man trained, equipped, and organized. There we go. Right. I'll get there it right. Uh, to fight as cavalry, they're basically a striker BCT, which that's what the army did. So, um, we it's something that we have maintained for quite some time. The army is going back to 
divisional reconnaissance. And we've kept armored reconnaissance uh, in, in our brigade combat teams, in our armored brigade combat teams. That's where I did some time uh, uh, at Fort Bliss uh, with the 1st Squadron, 1st Cavalry. Um, so this is, this is an idea that we've always had and we're always going to need. This is a capability that's never going to go away. In World War II, kind of to kind of neck this back to World War II, is my challenge to folks is to pay attention to what's going on to the sides and before and after the battles. We always want to pay attention to the main event, the relief of Bastogne, the fighting around Senbeth, which is a fascinating story. Yeah. Um, all, but pay attention to the shaping operations. What got us there? And how did we organize and equip those shaping operations? And how do we set ourselves up for success or failure in those? Because those are the stories that are kind of missing right now. Um, because when historians first, I mean, we got kind of the first cut, right? The green books, uh, the official histories, those came out right after the war. And then we got a lot of biographies or autobiographies. And then it started kind of going into filling in the big stuff. And there's a lot to be written. I mean, uh, as, a, as a professional historian, wearing my other hat, uh, there, it's people kind of say Northwest, American Army, Northwest Europe, and they kind of roll their eyes and go, it's been done. Well, yeah, the, this, know, yeah this, this is so frustrating. I mean, it's this, this stuff that is peripheral that shouldn't be. And, and the, the challenge historians face is if you're trying to, your narrative is to tell one particular story and this peripheral stuff, should be important, but you're also trying to take your your reader on a journey from A to B. And if you're bringing too much peripheral stuff in it, you just end up losing the reader in the in the fog of trying to cover everything and therefore covering nothing well. But it's you're you know absolutely right. I mean, when I when I'm doing a, I did one tour in the last four months for a Canadian, and he wanted to go and see um, where the Canadian parachute battalion were and Pegasus Bridge, of course. But I just did that explaining about how there's a British Airborne Division sitting on that ridge for three months, just on the edge. And everything else that happened to the west of that and all the Epsom and, and Blue Coats and Cobras are all happening because of that peripheral action there. And it's that kind of first piece of the jigsaw. And the same thing can apply to some of these dramatic advances like Fourth Armoured pushing up there is there's this action on the left, there's the action on the right, there's the thing happening below it, and they are all supporting and, and assisting this, this main thrust. But the main thrust is the sexy one. We said it ourselves. And when you get someone like Patton involved in the big characters, that just makes it even worse because people like writing about what sells. That's You, you said that yourself as well. But, but, and what's funny, though, is, is that we kind of miss, like, like well, what enabled this, right? Because one of the things that uh, I was struck by is we have a nine division camp, small army. And yet we're doing a broad front event. And we're also the Americans. We, we like our firepower and we like our mass assaults, how we fight. Uh, my joke is, is that we like battles that we can turn into math problems. Um, <laughs> and, well, how do you do that with a small army? And what you see is like, even in the Battle of the Bulge, you've got the 12th Corps, which uh, doesn't get talked about a lot. A um, oh, couple of really good ones. Uh, John Nelson Ricard, uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, yep. um, uh, has written about it. But 12th Corps, the, when they finally assault across the, the Sour River on the very southern edge of the Bulge, so that southern shoulder right there, what a lot, their infantry divisions are attacking on fronts of four or five kilometers. Imagine that, think about that one for a second. You got a, a division of like 15,000 soldiers attacking on a frontage of five kilometers. The second cavalry group is on the right flank covering 15 to 20 kilometers all yeah. by itself. And uh, so, well, okay, it's along the Moselle River, the Germans aren't attacking. Fine, but someone's got to be there, right? Or Germans will come over and do, again, bad things in capital letters to your loggies. And we love our loggies. We don't want them to die. Uh, what's, when you add in the second cavalry group, they're then tied into the third cavalry group, which is holding a significant part of the 20th Corps boundary. And suddenly you realize that 
vast portions of the Third Army line during just this one campaign are being held by a couple of cavalry groups. And Which, yeah, and, and this is why I'm going to take the opportunity uh, to, to, to recommend your book again. So fo I'll just come back to you in a second. So, folks, okay. uh, the link is in the description below. As I said at the beginning, save us through the Reich. It's going to fill in all the gaps and give a lot more detail. Some of Bill's colorful expressions are not always in the book there. It's a little bit more kind of formal, but no no less good for it. But some of the vernacular tonight has been really good. So I urge you to go and buy the book. And several of you said you'd already ordered it already while I've been watching the show. That's good for Bill's royalties, and it's good for me to make it look like that we're we're bringing on the right guests, which we are. So um, I'll bring back it, Bill, in now. We the, the, we've had several requests to bring you back again later on. We can do a deep dive into one other aspect of something, but for for a perfect debut performance, as far as I'm concerned. So um, we will bring things to end because uh, all good things must come to an end. Have you enjoyed talking to our to our viewers? Oh, it's been a blast. I've uh, had a lot of fun. One standard disclaimer, still, as an active duty person, everything I just said was my own opinion and not the uh, official opinion of U.S. government, Command General Staff College, or any of the others. But no, this is this has been a blast. I've, I've had a great time. This has really been um, a great experience. And Well, we will have you back. So um, I'll just remind people what's coming up, and I'll come back and say a formal goodbye in a second. So, folks, that's me done in terms of my official shows. The next one is a December the 28th. So after Christmas, Peter Lyon is coming on to talk about his book, Merg. And then we've got Steve Zaloga coming on, talking about smashing Hitler's panzers and lots of various more shows coming up there. But tomorrow, of course, don't forget, if you are a regular viewer, uh, and you are either you go to my Twitter feed or email me via YouTube or Patreon, there's a private kind of Zoom Christmas social tomorrow evening, same time. We can only accommodate a hundred of you, so you can't all come. But I know there's a couple of historians who are going to join us for that. So get in contact with me, and and we'll give you the details. As I uh, should always remind you, this series of shows is being sponsored by Battle Maps. Uh, so again, the link is in the description below. Go off to their website, buy yourself a nice. Omaha map, Civil War map, Ardennes map, whatever, and frame it and give it yourself as a Christmas present. And World War II TV gives you a discount. Um, but right now, I'm going to say thanks to Bill for joining us. And again, it, it, a fantastic book. It's going straight back on the shelf alongside some other works there. And um, you will come back next year and talk about something else, I hope. Uh, give me the opportunity to talk about World War II history. I will. Brilliant. Well, there we go then. So this has been fantastic. So this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying, I hope you have a very good Christmas and I will see you the other side of that break. And again, I want to just extend a hearty thank you for sticking with me all through this year or year and a half of programming because I can see that there is progress being made. Viewers are now going up. There's new guests. Uh, um, people watching the show every day now which is fantastic there's something i think maybe the youtube algorithm is starting to come in and fave me finally but as you know these deep dives where we talk for an hour and a half an hour and 45 minutes about one subject is youtube doesn't like that youtube likes everything in five minutes with animations and and explosions and we're not doing that so it's taken us a while to find our audience but for those of you who have been there from the beginning i have to again thank you for, for sticking with this because in the early days, I was kind of feeling my way through this, calling on a few mates. And now I'm at the position now where I'm contacting such amazing historians. And every single one I seem to bring on is an amazing superstar. Um, I, I love doing it. So there we are. This is Paul Woodard from World War II TV. I will see you after Christmas unless you join me for my social tomorrow. So thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of the day. Bye.